Jack, thanks so much for giving me this opportunity to ask you about your new book, Teaching and Learning in English Medium Instruction. Perhaps you could start with telling me about how it came about. Well, thanks, Sarah. Uh, this was something that happened uh, during COVID. I was uh, looking for some projects to work on since I was kind of housebound. And um, the idea of this book came uh, from conversations I had with colleagues in Singapore and Hong Kong, both countries where English medium instruction has a long history. And I linked up with a young uh, scholar there, also called Jack, Jack Pun, who helped me uh, gather all the research and data and information that I would need to put together a practical book for people interested in this uh, very interesting topic. So that's how it got started. So could you begin by clarifying what EMI is, what's novel about it, and, and why it's becoming so widely adopted? Well, there are two uh, places where English medium instruction is used. And one are the post-colonial countries where English was um, a heritage of the colonial administration. So in places like India, Pakistan, Ghana, Nigeria, Singapore, the Philippines, when the colonial administrations withdrew, they left in place an English medium education system, even though the students in schools would have come with many different language backgrounds. So that's one context where English has been a primary medium of instruction in public education. But more recently, in other parts of the world, um, English is increasingly used at the graduate level or even at the undergraduate level in countries where it would normally have been a foreign language, just taught as a school subject. So. You find today in the Nordic countries, uh, the Scandinavia, uh, for example, Holland, but also in Asia, in China, Japan, and so on, and, uh, universities that are teaching their graduate courses in English, which creates uh, a number of issues for both teachers and students and for the whole um, uh, educational um, landscape, really. And so those are the um, contexts where English medium instruction is growing. More and more universities are using now English in countries like Holland, Norway, Sweden, Russia even, Japan, Korea, and so on, for graduate education. But surely it's more logical and easier for the students to be learning in their mother tongue and for their lecturers to be teaching in their mother tongue, whether it's Chinese, Danish, or Dutch, rather than English language. It's not always something that uh, lecturers welcome when they're told by the university, you will have to start teaching your courses in English because we want to attract international students. So that's one of the motivations for the expansion of English medium instruction, to internationalize higher education, give um, far more students a chance to go to study in uh, foreign countries, but where English is the language used for their academic courses. Um, now that, of course, creates burdens for the teachers who may never have taught their subjects in English. And so they have to make a transition to teaching math, science, whatever the subject is in English, and also for students who might have come from all sorts of different parts of the world to a university in Denmark, for example, and are now having to study their academic courses in English for the first time. So it is a big, it is a big challenge for uh, teachers and for students. So why is EMI being more widely used around the world? Lots of reasons, but I think in each country the reason may be different as well. Certainly in the Scandinavian countries, in the, um, there was a, a policy decision by um, the governments there to try to provide a means for university teachers and students to move around within the European community to transfer credits from one university to another. And they could only do that if their degrees were comparable and taught in English. So that was one justification for the introduction of English medium instruction in, um, in Europe. In other countries like the Gulf States and Turkey, English medium instruction has also been widely used um, as a way of um, internationalizing their educational curriculum and also to help students develop better proficiency in English. So that's also another reason for English medium instruction. One of the differences between English medium instruction and other approaches that link content to English is that in English medium instruction, English is used as a medium for teaching content subjects. Whereas in other approaches in language teaching, content has been used as a way of teaching English. So it's a, a sort of reverse of the way uh, English language teaching is taught in other parts of the world. 
These are uh, very diverse justifications, and I assume it has huge implications for the nature of higher education. Well, yes, because one of the issues is do students learn as well and do teachers teach as well if they're having to teach in a, sub in a language which they're not necessarily uh, fully uh, competent in? Um, how does it impact their instructional processes, assessment, use of materials? Um, and also, these classes where they teach are now multicultural. So, having been trained to teach, for example, Russian students or Danish students, they suddenly find their classes now are taught in English with a whole variety of students from different parts of the world who have different expectations and traditions about how higher education takes place. So, lots of um, issues of that kind that um, we, we look at in the book. Um, how the transition to English medium instruction impacts education at a whole lot of different levels. Could you tell me about the kind of issues that are explored in the book? Well, I think, yes, there are, I think, 11 chapters. We look uh, in the first chapter at how it differs from foreign language education um, and what's special and unique about it. As I mentioned uh, a second ago, that what's different about it is in English medium instruction, English is a medium for teaching content academic subjects. In the second chapter, we look at all the different variables involved and how, um, as to, for example, which languages, which subjects will be taught in English, when it will be taught in English, what kind of um, proficiency in English the students will need to get into such a program, and also the teachers, um, and whether they'll use resources developed for Anglophone countries, like textbooks from the United States, or whether they'll use special specially designed textbooks written for their own context. So that we look at in the first, uh, second chapter. And then we get into a couple of chapters where we look at the nature of academic learning because it's all about the teaching of academic subjects, but what is involved in learning an academic subject, whether it be in a first language or in English as a second language. And we look at the uh, four dimensions of academic learning, um, concepts, and processes. We look at tasks, academic tasks. Um, we look at uh, text types, different kinds of text that occur in different uh, academic disciplines. So um, that's the, the core part of the book, is the, the four strands of English medium, medium education that uh, the students have to master, and so, of course, do lecturers. How do you describe the nature of academic literacy? It's a very big issue that philosophers, educators and others have thought about for years. Th that's right. What, is, what does learning science involve? What does learning history involve? And so on. Each of these um, subjects have their own um, disciplinary pedagogies also. So teachers of history teach their courses in a different way from teachers of geography and so on. So. Um, when you look at the teaching of, that goes on in EMI, it depends on, the, on this discipline. And in some disciplines, the teachers are much more conscious of uh, English and in others. So, for example, science teachers might say, yes, English is more important in science than it is in math. So one of the issues about English medium instruction is that the teachers are content teachers. They're not English teachers. They have no particular interest in or knowledge about English, and they don't tend to give any attention to it in when they teach their content subjects. So it's assumed that the students have got to get the English going on their own or through preparatory courses that they may take before they enter English medium instruction. I really like the way that throughout the book you have lots of interesting examples and comments from the content teachers and from the learners about how EMI influences their teaching and learning. And I noticed too that you have follow-up discussion questions and activities at the end of each chapter. Right, we've tried to make the book very accessible for um, people who are doing graduate courses in, uh, in pedagogy and also in language teaching. So lots of little uh, case studies and vignettes and little uh, problems for them to think about to try to um, bring it down to earth. There is a big literature on this subject, but it's uh, very research-oriented and mainly geared at other researchers. So what I've tried to do with Jack Pun in this book is to write a, a first level introductory survey of the topic, really. You've got chapters on EMI teachers, EMI teaching, and on the EMI learners. Could you say a little about what the issues are for EMI teachers and EMI learners? Well, 
one of the issues for the teachers is, of course, how proficient their English is and how comfortable they are teaching their, their subject in English and what strategies they use to help make their, their discipline comprehensible. Of, of, often it takes uh, a lot of compensatory strategies. Sometimes they'll use code switching, they'll switch to the student's mother tongue if they can in countries like um, Hong Kong where they can, but they can't of course in a multilingual classroom where students have many different language backgrounds. So how do they give explanations? How do they, um, how do they give feedback to students and what do they give feedback to students on? Is it on content learning or language learning? So um, lots of issues for the teachers. Also their sense of professional identity because they may have been confident uh, as a professional when they teach in their mother tongue, but is their sense of professional expertise teaching in a foreign language likely to be threatened? And it often is. They say, I would feel much more confident about my teaching if I were teaching in my own language. But when I'm teaching in English, I have to do a lot more identity work to try to um, position myself as a knowledgeable expert, which I don't have to do when I'm teaching in my mother tongue. So uh, subtle issues of this kind we look at in the book as well. So in the book you offer suggestions as to how EMI teachers can address some of the issues they face as well as the issues faced by learners. We do. Uh, we look, for example, at the teaching of the different skills, or the, of the learning of English uh, in the skill areas, reading, writing, listening, speaking, grammar and vocabulary. And we look at um, strategies that content teachers can use before they teach, thinking about the language demands of an activity, while they're teaching to make the, um, uh, the, the activity accessible to learners with limited English and, necessarily, and, and when necessary after they've taught as well. So for each of those um, domains, listening, speaking, reading and so on, we look at strategies teachers can use before, during and after teaching with exercises as well. And what sort of issues does EMI pose for learners? Well, the first one, of course, is, is language, whether they have sufficient academic vocabulary, because they probably need between five, six thousand, seven thousand words to be able to cope with academic learning. Also, um, a, a huge amount of terminology. And then, of course, the, the issue of um, their reading and writing skills, because probably when they did English as a foreign language at school, they were studying from simplified texts, not from authentic texts. Now they have to read textbooks written for native speakers of English, and they have to write essays and things and all sorts of um, activities in English which they're not familiar with. So a lot of um, support for the, the development of their language skills, which doesn't come from the content teacher. There they will have to get support from the English subject teachers or for a program in English for academic purposes, which many universities provide in contexts like these. Yet, you point out in your book that students sometimes choose to study in an EMI university even when other options are available. That's right. So even in Denmark, there might be a degree available in either English or Danish, but many of them will choose the option of doing it in English because they feel it adds a little um, extra value to their degree, and also if they plan to work overseas and do graduate work abroad. Again, students might go from Thailand, they could do an engineering degree in Thailand, why would they go to do one in Germany in uh, an English medium university? Well, maybe they value the, uh, the reputation of that university and they'd like to have that credential before they go back to their own country where they may not use much English at, at all. So what kinds of support do EMI institutions provide for learners who may never have taken academic courses in English before? In some contexts, they have to do a year preparatory uh, English studies in Oman, Saudi Arabia, um, Turkey, for example, before they can transition to English medium. They have to be uh, tested and they have to do an intensive um, full-time uh, English course for up to nine months and then they're tested again. So that sort of helps students transition. In other contexts, um, there will be language centers on the campus of the university that provide ongoing language support for international students. So they may get support once they start their EMI studies. Some of it is voluntary. It's not necessarily required, so it partly depends on their need. What about support for EMI teachers? That is typically not very substantial because it's sort of assumed if they speak English, they should be able to teach in English. Um, so not too many universities provide ongoing professional development support for content teachers. And in any case, many of the content teachers will not welcome it. 
They would say, I'm a scientist, I know, how to, I know my subject, I'm not interested in doing a workshop on how I can teach science better using English. So it's, um, it's difficult, to, not always impossible, but it's difficult to get uh, content teachers to accept the fact that they might benefit from prof uh, professional development. The chapter on providing professional support for EMI teachers offers many really useful guidelines and suggestions. Yes, we've, we've looked at everything we can find about how they do it in different contexts, but it's not um, that common. Uh, there's a need for much more attention to providing support for content teachers who have to teach in English. Um, Jack, I notice at the end of the book there's a really interesting postscript where you talk about the considerations that um, might be helpful for looking at best practices in EMI. That was, yes, that's probably a little bit cheeky of me to put that there. Um, but what I did was looked at the sort of problems that come up in the literature that are uh, documented um, and tried to outline how this can be addressed at policy level, at level of implementation, um, in, in terms of choosing teachers, choosing materials, and so on. So it's a short little summary of some of the questions that need to be considered if an institution is switching to English medium education. Um, there are examples where these uh, issues were not considered seriously. In Malaysia, for example, Mohamed Matia, the Prime Minister of Malaysia some years ago, was very concerned about the level of English of graduates from um, schools. And um, he decided that they should switch back to English medium instruction. They were using Malay, or the national language, Bahasa Malaysia. And they switched to uh, math and science in uh, English. The teachers were not ready for it. Many of them did not have a good grasp of English. They didn't have suitable materials. It was a bit of a disaster and they had to cancel the policy after several years of trying it. In Italy, the, the biggest polytechnic um, made a policy decision that all their courses would be taught in English. The teachers went on strike and um, complained to one of the educational authorities. The policy had to be changed. So um, sometimes it's a policy implemented based on issues from, uh, from the government, you know from the Prime Minister or whatever, but when it trickles down to the classroom level, a lot of the practical issues have not really been looked at very closely. Thanks very much for sharing this information about English medium instruction and the issues that form the focus of the book, Teaching and Learning in English Medium Instruction and Introduction. Thank you very much, nice to talk to you.